Welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, in connection with this uh, symposium, uh, the women faculty uh, in science and engineering car carried out a new study um, of the status of women faculty members in those two schools. Um, and uh, if you've read the report, an overwhelmingly positive uh, view of MIT uh, emerged uh, with dramatic improvements since the original 1999 report. We heard a lot about that yesterday. Uh, the, the positive uh, improvements include an increase in the number of women faculty members, more equitable resource and salary distribution, and the increase of women in senior administrative positions. The vast majority of the tenured and untenured women interviewed emphasized that MIT offers outstanding opportunities and resources, and that the institute is a much friendlier and supportive environment than perceived from the outside. Uh, despite these positive findings, there are still challenges. Some of these are the subjects of our panel discussion uh, this afternoon and relate to making academic careers at MIT even more attractive so that we can increase the fraction of women in our faculty even further. Uh, it's really important that we address some of these issues. It's also likely that similar improvements will increase the racial diversity of our faculty. The organizers have asked us uh, in this session to address several issues. One is making science, technology, engineering, and mathematics careers more attractive to young women. Second, balancing the needs of young women to start families and starting academic careers. Three, eliminating harassment. Four, improving the climate for women in other ways. Uh, I guess there were four. Um, I will introduce our three panelists, and then I'll ask each of them to speak for 15 minutes on these topics. We'll then uh, take questions from the audience. So I'm going to introduce all three of them, and then they'll speak in turn. And I'm introducing them alphabetically, and it happens that the first is a male, but I apologize for that. <laughs> it's my friend Bob. <clears throat> uh, on, on Wiki, Wikipedia, it says Bob Bergino is a Canadian physicist, which is true. Uh, he's chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley. And prior to that, he was president of the University of Toronto from 2000 to 2004. Uh, Bob was the first of his family to finish high school. He graduated from St. Michael's College in Toronto, receiving a Bachelor of Science degree um, in mathematics. Uh, and then he received his PhD in physics from Yale in 1966. Uh, from 1968 to 75, he worked at AT&T Bell Laboratories, and then he joined MIT as a professor of physics. During his 25 years at MIT, he served as chair of the physics department and then as dean of science. Virginaud's research accomplishments have had great impact, and he has been honored for them in many ways. He's a fellow of the US National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society of London, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. Among the awards he has received for his research on the fundamental properties of materials is the Oliver E. Buckley Prize of the American Physical Society. Throughout his career, Bergenau has been a passionate advocate for increasing diversity in academia. In 2008, he received the Carnegie Corporation Academic Leadership Award for championing excellence and diversity in education. Most recently, he was one of three uh, recipients of the Shinyo N Foundation's 2009 Pathfinders to Peace Prize for his, quote, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to the integration of public service as an essential component of the academic experience. Our second panelist is Dr. Heidi Hamill, who is the Executive Vice President of the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, called Aura. It operates world-class astronomical observatories. Dr. Hamill is also an interdisciplinary scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Her prim primary scientific research focuses on astronomical observations of planetary atmospheres. 
Dr. Hamill also does a significant amount of award-winning education and public outreach work. In her spare time, she's a single mother of three school-aged children. Hamill received her undergraduate degree from MIT in 1982 and her PhD from the University of Hawaii in 1988. After a postdoc at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, she returned to MIT, where she spent nearly nine years as a principal research scientist in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. In 1999, she joined the Space Science Institute in Boulder, Colorado as senior research scientist and eventually co-director of research. Her position at Aura began in 2011. <clears throat> Lisa Motz is Director of Public, Public Policy and Government Relations at AAUW, the Asso American Association of University Women, which started as the Association of Collegiate Alumni, founded in 1882. Ellen Swallow Richards, MIT's first female graduate, was one of the co-founders, and MIT was one of two charter members. As AAUW's top policy advisor, Lisa Motz works to advance AAUW's priority issues in Washington. Motz provides leadership to several coalitions working to advance opportunities for women and girls. Recently featured in the book Secrets of Powerful Women, Motz has developed a reputation for her strategic approach to legislation and advocacy. She has done similar work for the Now Legal Defense and Education Fund and the Older Women's League, and was a legislat legislat legislative aide to US Representative Carolyn Maloney. Her grassroots advocacy career began when she was the executive director of Turning Point, a battered women's program recognized for excellence by the Ohio Supreme Court. Matz is a graduate of Ohio University has two master's degrees from Ohio State University. She holds an adjunct appointment with the Women in Politics Institute at American University. Her honors include the Women's Information Network's Young Woman of Achievement Award and the Mentor Award from the Public Leader Leadership Education Network. Motz was also a congressional fellow for the Women's Research and Education Institute and, and has received a mayoral appointment to the Washington, D.C. Commission on Women. Um, I think my first slide, my only slide, if there's a slide, well, it just repeats the uh, topics that were supposed to be the, the uh, topics of discussion today. So let's move along, and I'll ask Bob Bergenau to uh, speak first. Thank you so, uh, so much, Mark, and it's just such a privilege to be back here at MIT uh, and to see so many old friends and to have even gotten the chance to make some new friends. Why is this not advancing? Okay, so uh, I thought I would really, just as a foil, uh, and I apologize uh, coming from Berkeley, but since I'm Chancellor of Berkeley, the, situation I'm most familiar with is, of course, UC Berkeley. So I thought just as a foil, I would uh, show you some uh, data from Berkeley, uh, discuss uh, what we're doing at Berkeley to try and address the issues, which have been the subject of this meeting uh, for the last day and a half. But then I want to move on. I will try and very quickly move on from challenges that women face in science and engineering to challenges that underrepresented groups face more generally and where we're making progress and where we're not making progress and tell you a few of the things that we're doing at, at Berkeley, uh, some of which uh, M MIT might uh, emulate. So if we look at the number of uh, women faculty at Berkeley as a function of time, you can see progress is slow, but it is sure. And so over the last uh, decade and a half, we've gradually increased the number of uh, women faculty while keeping the overall size of the faculty constant so that women now constitute uh, just under, for 210 to 11, just under 30% of the faculty at, U at UC Berkeley. Um, okay. Probably the single most important thing we've done at Berkeley, and I know similar things have happened here at MIT as well, uh, is the full recognition for all of our faculty, uh, male, female, same-sex couples, uh, different-sex couples, 
uh, of the importance of having uh, family-friendly policies for our faculty. Uh, and we've had two of our faculty members, uh, the former dean of the graduate school, uh, Marianne Mason, and then a second professor of chemistry, Angela Stacy, uh, who have been who have really been forefront thinkers on this. And so, um, among the, our family-friendly policies, uh, first of all, importantly, we have active service modified duties, and so every couple uh, with a, a newborn or an adopted child. Uh, have modified service, which means they're excused from teaching and, and committee duty for one semester. And for birth mothers, they're granted as an entitlement a second semester of relief of duty. So the faculty keep their research active, uh, but, they're not, but their duties are absolutely minimized. Uh, as soon as a faculty member elects as an entitlement for active service modified duties, one year delay, not delay, but extension of the tenure clock, clock is automatically uh, uh, implemented. So the person does not have to request it. That turns out to be extremely important. And the faculty member may or may not choose to take advantage of that, but it's a right uh, that's consistent with tenure clock uh, stoppage. Something we've introduced just in the last few years, which has turned out to have an inordinately positive impact is uh, our vice provost faculty created what he called Calcierge, which is just a play on Cal, it's really concierge, which is a person whose full-time job is to help families relocate to Berkeley and the Bay Area. And that person turns out to be tremendously effective, first of all, in helping spouses find a job, helping people locate housing, helping the family locate daycare, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that, you know, cost of one person in their office has turned out to have a tremendously positive impact and minimize the burden for people moving. Uh, finally, and I think this is true here uh, at uh, MIT also, we've introduced emergency backup care, where basically, uh, which is a phenomenal hit with junior faculty, and we've now generalized it so any faculty member can avail themselves of it, which is that, you know, if a parent is sick, if your child is sick, or even if you're writing a proposal and you just can't take care of your children during the days you're trying to write a proposal, then this service automatically provides childcare or parent care for you uh, at, a, at a nominal cost. Uh, and this turns out to be a remarkably inexpensive investment. So it turns out all of these have really had a tremendously positive impact on our faculty, but most especially uh, women faculty. This has manifested itself. Uh, so how do you measure this? Well, one way that it's manifested itself, which I think is really quite dramatic, is in 2003, before we introduced all of these various family-friendly package uh, processes, at that time, two-thirds of our junior faculty had no children. Since introducing these, if you now look at the makeup of our faculty, this is both male and female faculty members. 39% uh, 39 have no children, but the remaining 61% have either one, two, three, or more children. So this is an incredibly dramatic change. And if I now just focus on women faculty and how that has changed between 2003 and 2009, one of the dramatic results uh, in the study in the, in the middle 90s was how few women faculty felt that they could take the risk of having children as a junior faculty member because they felt it would be, there was so much cultural bias against uh, women having children as junior faculty members. So now at Cal, uh, because of these change in policies, fully two thirds of our uh, women junior faculty have, have families. Uh, and again, varying between one, two, and three children. Uh, and so our women faculty are able, and male faculty too, but women faculty in particular, are able to experience a full family life uh, and simultaneously uh, uh, be able to pursue their careers and get tenure, et cetera, uh, effectively. So that's all I'm gonna say about issues that are specific to, to uh, Women uh, in academia, uh, clearly there are still lots of things that we can do, but one of the things we've really learned at Berkeley is many small things which make life easier for people and remove the typical barriers have an incredibly important effect uh, on, on uh, uh, women in their careers and their satisfaction. So when you do satisfaction surveys, the satisfaction level of our junior faculty, male and female, is incredibly high. One of the, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, one of the other things, uh, but here we have the advantage of having 
both a large psychology department and a school of education uh, is that we also have very robust daycare. Uh, we reserve 80 slots uh, for faculty. We have eight daycare, eight daycare centers on campus. Uh, and these are also, frankly, also run as sort of educational centers because we have a number of faculty whose specialty is in preschool education. And therefore, uh, that turns out to create an incredibly positive environment. Uh, the only challenge is the cost, frankly. Uh, and so that's an unsolved problem. It is solved for our women graduate students and undergraduates, where there's both, we invest a huge amount of money uh, in support of, of our women graduate and undergraduate students for child support. So uh, that's also turned out to be uh, extraordinarily beneficial. So I'd like to now switch to the more general challenges that we face uh, in academia for underrepresented minorities, where it's a less salubrious story, I'm afraid. So if we look at the Berkeley data and we say uh, how has uh, uh, the number of underrepresented minorities evolved as a function of time, uh, and this is something where we've put in uh, a lot of, of uh, energy uh, with only partial success. So this shows you the number of underrepresented minority faculty as a whole. This is uh, out of uh, 1,500 faculty at Berkeley, and there's somewhat in excess. There's now about 120. Uh, there's a recent rise in the last several years. I'll tell you, because we've been working really hard on that. Uh, and, but uh, the situation for Asian Americans is rather more positive. And you see there's been a really rapid rise uh, within the past decade, actually, in the number of Asian American faculty members at Berkeley. However, if we look at uh, underrepresented minorities specifically, uh, then you can see an interesting trend here. Sadly, at Berkeley, over the last 20 years, the number of African-American faculty has stayed flat at about, at about 40, uh, in spite of a lot of energy that we've put into this. Recently, because of some concerted effort, and this is particularly relevant in California, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of Chicano Latino uh, faculty at Berkeley. So in that way, we are making some progress. Uh, but uh, this uh, is, an, is an unrelenting challenge for us and obviously, we're hoping that the family-friendly policies, which are turning out to be very successful for women in academia, will be equally successful uh, in making life easier for our underrepresented minority faculty. I now want to switch to uh, a purely academic subject. So shortly after I arrived at, at Berkeley as chancellor, several faculty appeared in my office, actually. Many different faculty with special interests appeared in my office. But there's one that caught my attention. Uh, uh, the same Angie Stacy, the one who I mentioned already, the chemistry professor, who's been so effective in terms of policies for women in academia. Uh, and then an astrophysicist, an African American by the name of Gabor Basri, very distinguished African American, appeared in my office and said, You know, we're in California. Uh, California is, excluding Hawaii, the first state where there is no majority population. Uh, but our academic programs don't reflect that fact. Uh, and specifically, uh, they argued California is a living laboratory, uh, and, and that uh, even though one was a chemist and one was an astrophysicist, they argued that the social science of equity and inclusion was as important an academic subject and even less understood than any of the frontier work they were doing in chemistry or in astrophysics or what have you. And so they advocated that we should create a new, essentially, department, which would be a bona fide academic department, which would attempt to understand what multicultural societies and how and inequities in society as an academic subject. And so after some time, as usual in academia, you have a committee, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, uh, we created a new research center, called, which is now called the Haas Diversity Research Center, uh, after the Haas family who have funded this initiative. Uh, and we committed 12 new faculty positions uh, to create this center. But these faculty positions are, in a way, 12 plus 12, because all of the faculty members are both uh, members of this center, but also members of some other academic department, so one half in each. Okay? Uh, and part of our goal here was to ensure that this wasn't isolated, just you know, a program that's off in one corner, uh, but that we had faculty members from law, from economics, from public health, et cetera, involved. 
uh, and that is working quite successfully. Uh, interestingly, it has turned out that this has been very easy to raise philanthropic money for. Uh, and so to date, uh, mostly the Haas family, which traces its money back to blue jeans, so I encourage all of you to buy Levi's, uh, since it's Levi Strauss money, actually, ultimately, uh, three generations later. Uh, very socially conscious, outstanding family. Uh, and so they, plus the uh, Hewlett Foundation, have altogether contributed about $35 million to underwrite uh, this effort, uh, including uh, six endowed chairs uh, and a distinguished, a seventh, which is a distinguished chair for the director of this, uh, of this initiative. So there are altogether currently six academic programs, one in, uh, to understand educational disparities, that is, how do we understand the differences in, in educational achievements among different groups, ethnic and otherwise? One, health disparities. One, to understand why democracy, our democratic system in the United States, works for some groups and does not work for other groups. Fourth is obviously economic disparities. Uh, fifth is on gender issues. It's LBGT oriented, but in fact it's uh, the Women's Studies Department, which actually is playing the lead role in this. Uh, and then the sixth is uh, Disability Studies. So each of these programs have five or six faculty members connected with them uh, from all over the university. Uh, interestingly, the program in disabilities is actually led by our humanities faculty. Uh, uh, the social sciences, law, et cetera, tend to dominate uh, in, in, in the others. This has enabled us these programs to recruit to Berkeley some phenomenal new faculty members. Uh, one, Nahil Nasir, African-American woman that we managed to recruit away from Stanford, whose research is on understanding the particular challenges of K through 12 and African-Americans, the challenges that African-Americans encounter in trying to master uh, mathematics and science in high schools. And uh, this is just an absolutely brilliant uh, uh, a new woman faculty member who's just been pretty extraordinary. So uh, along with this and the over, uh, person who oversees this is one of the things we realized early on, and this also was faculty driven, that we wouldn't make the kind of progress we needed to make, and I think we are now making at Berkeley, unless uh, equity and inclusion was a part of every conversation. Uh, and the only way to guarantee that was to create a position of a vice chancellor, the equivalent of a vice president here at MIT, a vice chancellor for equity and inclusion. Uh, and so that person is present at every single meeting. And you might say, well, you know, why, for example, should such a person be, where does equity and inclusion come into capital projects? Well, it turns out that if you want to be able to uh, give minority-owned construction firms uh, an opportunity to bid, then you have to have your capital projects broken down so that the size of the project is commensurate with, with building projects that minority firms can take on, et cetera. So equity and inclusion turns out to, uh, to impact a, a remarkable, bro remarkably broad range of activities that the university participates in. So finally then, with the center, we currently have 12 FTE, but there are many more, large number of endowed chairs, uh, and we, in essence, have turned equity and inclusion from, if you like, social programs at universities to genuine academic programs. And we're very hopeful that the kind of scholarship, which is, you know, leads to Nobel Prizes in physics, that will have the functional equivalent of Nobel Prizes in, uh, in equity and inclusion coming out of this endeavor. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you, and I look forward to hearing our next two speakers. That's great. Our next speaker is Heidi Hamm. Hi, it's great to be here. You know, I am a woman of MIT. Um, I was an undergrad here, and, and then after escaping, I was drawn back into the fold for nine years, but I escaped again. Uh, when I found out about this conference, I was very excited about coming here, and when they asked me to participate in the panel, I thought, that's, wow, that's great, but you know, it's, this panel's about academia, and, and I don't know anything about that because I've never been in academia. 
And we'll come back to that a little later. But when I, I asked, well, what, are you, what do you want us to talk about? They sort of had this laundry list, which we never got to see. But the first one on there was work-life balance. Or, and I said, well, gosh, I can sure talk about that. Uh, because as you heard in the introduction, in my spare time, when I'm not running the major US astronomical facilities, uh, I have three children who are ages 9, 11, and a, a daughter who's 13. So I know all about family issues, and I can talk about that not in an academic sense, but in a very personal sense. Now, since I am a graduate of MIT, I decided to build a model of work-life balance. And since I am, in fact, a mother of school-aged children, I can build a model of anything out of things you find around the house. <laughs> so here's my model. This is my model of work-life balance. It's made out of Dixie cups and yarn and tape, taped to some straws that are hanging from a blue crayon that has a pin stuck through it. For safety's sake, of course, it's stuck into an eraser so you can't hurt yourself with it. Those of you who have small children know you've got to do stuff like that. All right, but that's just the model. There's more. OK, we got to have our simulated work in life. So here's life, yellow Legos, life. And here's work, the red Legos. So can you help me with this sure. and help me? That's a very important lesson, young ladies. Always ask for help. Always, always, you need help. All right. So, all right, so let's see. I said that this was life. So my life, I mean, every morning starts with life, all right, because you got three kids that you got to get up and get out of bed. So the scale instantly tips down. And the other morning, I, it was like three days ago, all three kids were sitting at the breakfast table, clothed, eating breakfast, not fighting. And I said, I just took a step back and said, I'm super mom. All my children are dressed, eating breakfast, and it's half an hour before the bus comes. You know, it's great. All right, so they go off to school and fine, and you think, okay, now I'm going to start working. Right, okay, so the scale goes to work, all right? But immediately, the phone rings. It's your nine-year-old, Mom, Mom, I forgot my viola. Can you come pick it up and bring it into school? Okay, all right, it's fine. So you leave work, you go, you take the viola in, and then you get back to work, and the phone rings again, and it's your job, people saying, oh, Heidi, you didn't ever turn in your, your technical reports on that grant, so NSF won't send any more money to our facility until you send it in, now. Okay, so let's go, all right, that's all right, I'll do that. No problem, no problem. And you go along, and then you, then you realize, oh my God, today is the day the reports are due for the telescope. You gotta do that too. So you do all that. And then the phone rings again, all right? All right, and they say to you, it's daycare calling. Your daughter, she has head lice. <laughs> come pick her up. And she can't come back for three days of being knit free. All right, so that's an interesting thing. All right, and so then life goes on. You know, this is just, this is true stories, by the way. It's absolutely a true story. And so then, you know, we're in balancing here. And you know, this is just a regular, you, got, you all know what I'm talking about. The proposal's due, the proposal's due, and your printer runs out of ink. And you don't have a backup ink jet, so you gotta run off to the store and do that. And in the meantime, you know, your, your, your son, he calls you, Mom, you know, we gotta go because I need this thing to do my report and see what happens to your skin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, that's only about halfway through the day. In reality, this is, this is what a day is like. There are sizes and shapes of crises you never dreamed of. I was thinking of asking one of these guys to dump this over my head for dramatic effect, because you know, that's what life is really like as a mom and working full time. But I figured then this would look just like my living room floor and I'd have to pick them all up, which is where I got them from anyway the day before yesterday. All right. So I'll put these over here to remind you about work-life balance. Um, my message, though, pertaining to our subject today is that, in fact, we are the scales. We are this broken straw, right? <laughs> our goal here, what we're talking about today, is how to keep this strong. 
Because those things are going to happen. Anybody who works in academia, or doesn't work in academia in my case, you have to deal with this. So what are the, what are the things that we can do to help? The kind of things that you heard um, Bob Bergen are talking about is, is those are policies that help strengthen this, right? They help. They won't solve the problem. And I, I do want to say this, and I, I, I was really conflicted about sharing this information with you here today, because this is a celebration of MIT and a celebration of all the progress that has been made at MIT. And believe me, as someone who was here 30 years ago, I can tell you the progress has been considerable. But it's the caveat, the celebration with caveats. All these amazing programs that you've been hearing about and that you just heard about at Berkeley, how would they have helped me with my first child here at MIT? Not in any way whatsoever. Because I was not a faculty member here. I was a research scientist, a principal research scientist, it's very nice, but all these programs for faculty don't help people like me. And there are many people here, many young women here, who won't necessarily become faculty members. What are we doing to help them? Those programs for child care, wow, wouldn't help me. All the programs for assistance wouldn't help me. All right. So how did I make it? All right, I found an organization when I had the, the dual career problem, the dual couple. My, my now ex-husband took a job somewhere, and I had a baby, and we moved there. And MIT said, no, you got to be up in Cambridge. And I'm like, well, I'm not. I'm in Connecticut. And they said, well, choose. So I chose to leave MIT at that time. And I got a position with an organization called the Space Science Institute in Boulder, Colorado. But they allowed me to work in Connecticut, where my family was. And in fact, the Space Science Institute, the research branch there, the third, one third of our organization, is not in Boulder at all. We're spread out across the United States. We're anywhere anybody wants to be, but we work remotely from our homes. It was terrific, absolutely terrific opportunity. And I also am very proud of the work I did at Space Science Institute because the institute itself was committed to diversity. Uh, women like me, uh, uh, the gender issues, it's not an issue. We had uh, lesbians working for our organization openly. Uh, we just talked about it. It didn't matter. Anybody who had work to be done, got a research grant, Space Science Institute would work for you. I left Space Science Institute just this past January 1st because I was offered the job opportunity of a lifetime. And I decided it was time, it was time to take that opportunity to go to try to make the next generation of space facilities available to young people, whether it's space telescopes, whether it's ground-based telescopes. I have an opportunity to do that. But I was very upfront with them. I said, look, I got this issue right now where I've got kids. We're in Connecticut. I'm not moving to Washington anytime soon. They said, OK, we'll make that work for you. And so right now, I'm commuting to Washington and working remotely. And it's been working out very well for me. I think because I knew that it would work. I told them it would work. I said, this is going to work. Got to make it happen. So. I guess the, the message I want to get across to you today is twofold. First of all, it is not easy being a full-time working scientist, an academic, and a parent. I mean, you heard that, but I just need to say it over and over again. I am so glad that MIT and other universities are recognizing that and taking proactive steps to make it easier, to make it possible. Uh, at the same time, I challenge all of you, particularly those of you who are working in the highest levels of academia, to acknowledge, to recognize, to remember that there are young people in your midst who are not on the faculty track. So please, please be aware of that. And let's see what we can do to help those young people. And I think I'll leave it at that and answer questions later.
sure to display. That's great. Thanks. You too. I'll come the way. And our last uh, 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 panelist is Lisa Motz. Oh, well, I hate to disappoint you, but I don't have those kind of visuals. <laughs> Hopefully, I can keep you entertained in other ways. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. AUW has had such a nice history, a rich history with MIT and with the Boston area, actually. We were founded here uh, in Boston back in 1881. Uh, and I like to call those 17 women kind of the original uppity women because they had college degrees and they had the nerve to actually want to do something meaningful with them. Uh, they also wanted to have more women join them as in the ranks of college gra graduates. Uh, and so uh, when you think about it, back in 1881, that was a pretty rebellious uh, thing to do. And so we're very proud of that history. Um, AEW has been working in the, the STEM fields for a very long time. Um, we have over 100,000 members and 1,000 branches across the country. And our work really centers in a variety of different ways. We do research. Uh, and uh, one of the things we've done most recently in this area is a research report called Why So Few uh, that I hope many of you will take a look at uh, on our website. You can download it for free. We also do public policy work, which is the work that I do. Uh, I have to admit, I'm a lobbyist, but I do use my powers for good, I swear, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, one of the things that we do within the public policy realm is look at some of the best practices that we see coming out of research, coming out of uh, reports and so forth, and trying to put that into action, trying to make sure that uh, programs that we know are good get the funding that they need to continue. Uh, as you can imagine, in this particular environment, that last one uh, is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, we also do wonderful programming. I just was in Buffalo, New York, for instance, with our Buffalo branch. And they had their sixth annual Tech Savvy Day, which was 500 11 to 14-year-old girls uh, for a day-long kind of symposium, camp, workshop, what have you, on STEM, on all kinds of different hands-on models that they could do and, and enjoy. Even more importantly, they also had 200 of their parents going through the day as well on a separate track, talking about things that parents need to do in order to keep the STEM fields open to their kids, in order to make sure that they're a viable option if their kid has that interest, and how to encourage that interest, especially in girls. But our history also goes back to fellowships and grants. For those of you who might not know it, I think this is one of the best kept secrets about AEW. We give anywhere from three to five million dollars a year for women's postgraduate work. Uh, for, for uh, doctorates and so forth, for graduate degrees. Um, because especially back in the day, we were trying to put our money where our mouth is. And one of the things that was really an issue for women faculty and for women who wanted to be faculty was to get research money. And it was harder for women to get research money, so the AUW women said, okay, well, we'll give them the research money. Doesn't matter where the money comes from, right? Um, so actually, one of the first things that we did that we're particularly proud of uh, is that we were, we were the ones who bought uh, Madame Curie her first gram of radium, uh, which uh, back in 1920 cost about $150,000, which now is over $1.6 million. So those are the AEW ladies. They put their money where their mouth is, and on this particular issue, uh, we, ref we definitely have some street cred. Um, one of the things that I want to focus on is things that we're talking about in terms of how to get more girls and more women into the STEM fields, and also how to deal with the climate uh, issue. Because one of the things that we know, uh, of course, is that there's a leaky pipeline. And so you kind of lose girls and then women along the way uh, in various science and STEM fields. What can we do about that? Uh, how can we kind of be vigilant and try and stem that, that leaky pipeline? So one of the first places we try and do this, obviously, is in education, right? Uh, many of you, if you're watching the news, might know that one of the things they're talking about in Washington, D.C., uh, aside from the budget and whether to close down the federal government, which at this point some of us think might not be a bad idea, um, but essentially uh, one of the things they're talking about is reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Act, also known as No Child Left Behind. Not a really popular law. One of the things that happens with No Child Left Behind, because it's emphasis on testing, 
right? It's a, it's a do or die, win or take all, emphasis on testing, is that they teach to the tests. So if all we want our kids to be able to do is to read and do math, that's fine. But you look at any school's curriculum now and you will see a huge drop in science. A huge drop in science. I don't care if they can add, multiply, you know, and divide. If they don't actually go in and do some science work as well, if they don't go in and do chemistry work as well, they're not going to be able to use that and apply that in a way that could be useful. So one of the things we're talking about in the reauthorization is, number one, no more high stakes testing. Testing is a useful tool, but it should not be the only thing we use to measure achievement. Number two, let's make sure we're getting science in there, because we're kind of missing the boat here, and uh, uh, in that sense, really not preparing our students. The other thing that we have talked about is, of course, trying to get more kids into AP classes. Uh, unfortunately, um, one of the things that we see with girls in high school is that they take the AP classes, but they don't take the AP test which I find very interesting. Now, they don't take the AP classes in the same rate as boys do, but, but still, they it's not that big of a difference. The problem is taking the test. And so what's going on there that we need to address to make sure they're taking that next step? We also want to make sure, of course, that we are, as I said earlier, dealing with the parents. Uh, because one of the things that we know from AEW's own research in the Why So Few report is that parental attitudes, parental notions about what kind of work is appropriate for girls and what kind of work is appropriate for boys, obviously can have a huge influence on a kid. And so having a conversation with parents and actually working through some of those issues can really make a difference. The other thing, of course, that we've seen is that when you talk about trying to get more girls into STEM, you actually need to start talking about middle schoolers. Because if they haven't started taking the right middle, the math classes in middle school, they're not going to have the preparation they need for the right math classes and science classes in high school. So it, actually, in a very real sense, especially with today's kind of uh, curriculum issues, you can actually kind of put a girl off the path of a STEM field in seventh grade if you don't get her into algebra. Because if you don't get her into algebra then, she's not going to progress fast enough. She won't be able to take AP when she gets to be a senior. So these are decisions that you know, parents already have it tough enough, but they need to be thinking of probably even sooner uh, than they had probably thought of originally. Another thing that we've been talking about, uh, and I said before, we try to put research into practice. There was this great report that came out from the National Science Foundation called Beyond Bias and Barriers. And it was looking at women in academia. Uh, and one of the things that uh, they put in as a recommendation uh, which I thought made a lot of sense, especially given what Heidi just talked about, was the way that the government structures its grants. And one of the things that we actually have a bill that we're working with uh, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson from Texas on is to make sure that when grants are given, there are allowances made either to pay for childcare or potentially to pay for uh, kind of a replacement scientist if you need to go on maternity leave. Or, or paternity leave, right? So the reality, because the reality is, especially for some science experiments and such, you know, cells aren't going to stop dividing, things aren't going to stop growing. Whatever your research is is going to continue, even if you have uh, uh, want to stay home and do some things uh, for a newborn. So having that flexibility, I think, is going to be key. I think one of the most profound things, though, that came out of that report is something that probably will surprise some of you. Donna Shalala was the chair of that particular uh, committee. And one of the things that she said when she was testifying before Congress was, look, I run a major research institution. I also happen to run a major athletic institution. Now, I can tell you exactly where my university stands in terms of Title IX when it comes to athletics. I can tell you what we do with our coaches, how many resources we give our teams, the number of male athletes to female athletes. I know exactly where we stand. Part of the reason for that is because we're a member of the NCAA. And they require us, and the federal government, by the way, requires us through the uh, Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act to report those statistics. So I know. I know where we stand. Now, a lot of you might not know it, but Title IX actually applies to any federally funded program that receives federal money, educational program that receives federal money. That means you cannot discriminate based on sex in any program, any educational program that receives federal funds. 
That means that we can use Title IX as a tool to advance girls and women in STEM. We can do this through compliance reviews. One of the things that has happened and been very interesting at the federal level, you know, even if you're not getting a grant from the Department of Education, if you are getting a grant and it is educational programming or it's going to an educational institution, you have to be in compliance with Title IX. So if you're getting a grant from NASA to look at some things, you have to be in compliance with Title IX. NASA has actually started doing its own uh, internal compliance reviews to make sure that they are following what, it says to, what Title IX says it should do. That's a key thing. That's a tool we already have in our toolbox if only we would use it. Right? We have seen a huge growth in the number of girls playing athletics ever since uh, Title IX was passed in 1972 like a 900% increase in the number of girls playing sports in high school. That's huge, right? That's an amazing growth pattern. Imagine if we could do that with STEM. Imagine if we could use Title IX in the same way, with the same tools, with the same focus. Imagine what we would have. And that's not just about giving girls an opportunity to play ball, because that's important. Girls who are af uh, actually af uh, active in sports, they're much more likely to graduate, they're much less likely to get pregnant, they don't use drugs, they get better grades, all that stuff. But one of the things that we know in terms of using it in terms of STEM, we don't have that kind of NCAA-like institution. And that's one of the things that Beyond Bias and Barriers actually recommended. We need to come up with some kind of quasi-governmental institution that has the same kind of data reporting requirements that sports do. I mean, if we have to report about sports, why not? have some information about the STEM fields, and do the same kind of work there in terms of building up women and in the STEM field. So that, I think, is a particularly workable uh, kind of uh, a solution because there are so, there's so much money that flows from the federal government. There are a lot of people who get those grants, and one of the things that it says, are you in compliance with Title IX? And they just have to check a box, right? I would like to have them do more than check a box. And, oh, by the way, if you're one of those folks who get those grants, you should know that the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education is now expecting you to do more than check the box. Right? They're actually going out and proactively, randomly selecting uh, universities to do compliance reviews, where they come in and they see if you're doing okay. Uh, and it happens. Notre Dame had one uh, a couple of years ago. And one of the things that came out of it, which I thought was fascinating, and it is actually, I think, very demonstrated in AUW's Why So Few report as well, is that they realized they needed to kind of restructure their curriculum. That, one of the, that they really had this huge leaky pipeline in the engineering fields with women at Notre Dame. And they looked at the curriculum and they realized that the first course they have people who are declared majors in engineering take is kind of a weed them out math course. It's the very first course they have them take. So there were a lot of women who, even though they might have gotten through that math course, actually changed majors fairly quickly after that. So they changed their curriculum around, and they actually have, as their first course now, more of an introduction into what engineering is, what engineering can do. The reason why this is important is because one of the things we know from girls and women in the sciences is that a lot of times their interest stems not necessarily most immediately from the science, but how can they use it to help people? How can they use it to make a better world? How can they use it to improve their situation and the situation of others? And so if you have a course that shows them that, before you then get into the more esoteric kinds of nuts and bolts about how it works, you can actually then help them see how these classes all apply uh, and how they kind of build on each other, right? A really good example of that we were just talking about recently, uh, it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that the crash test dummies actually started to be uh, they started to use crash test dummies the size of women. Now, if they had been using crash test, test dummies the size of women when they started using airbags, we would have found out sooner that if you're a 5'2 woman, 100 pounds soaking wet, an airbag is not your friend, right? There has to be an adjustment made to it. But because we were only using male-sized crash dummies, they didn't know. And we had to actually have all those injuries and deaths to prove it, right? So, that's a place where the applied sciences, in many respects, for women and girls can make sense, a place where they feel like they can make a difference. 
The other thing that I wanted to mention real quickly is just some other things that we're doing on a policy level to try and make STEM fields more uh, open to women and girls. There was a lot of talk about childcare. I think that's a huge issue. Um, the federal uh, funding for childcare, unfortunately, is under attack at the moment. But we've been trying to not only increase that funding, but to get them to be a little more common sense about how they use it. So that it's not like a eight to five childcare, that it also runs at night, that it runs on the weekend, that it works for graduate students and faculty members. Um, some other things that we have been looking at is uh, trying to make sure that when you have campus policies put in, put in place, that there's a real kind of thought processes about consequences and even unintended consequences. Uh, one of the other things that Notre Dame did as a result of their Title IX compliance review is they actually ended up putting, to, uh, putting together a, uh, a dorm, a residence hall, uh, that was just for women in science, a STEM dorm essentially. Um, and having that cohort, kind of the, you know, they called it the posse effect, having their, the folks around them was something that was really useful in terms of keeping them in the program. So let me just stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and I do just want to say again, thank you for having us here today. This has uh, really been a great panel. Thank you. So now we'll open the floor for questions. And I ask you to come up and use the microphone if you have a question you'd like to ask. Uh, let me pick up on Heidi's comments. And I hope it's not an embarrassing question that I'll ask our Berkeley and MIT deans and chancellors to answer to what extent these new programs are reaching into the postdoc and graduate student levels these days. And research scientists levels. <laughs> Ask, uh, ask Bob, because I think, you know, uh, we, I think we all feel very strongly that daycare, in particular, should be provided to a very broad community. But we haven't figured out a way uh, to do it at MIT without bankrupting ourselves. So I'd like to know how you've managed this for the graduate students. So, so uh, in California, so, so first of all, in terms of the research scientists, I think uh, Heidi, I mean, I agree with everything she said, actually. So she made a really important point there. It happens at Berkeley, the research scientists primarily are appointed at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. So actually, we, we don't have the equivalent ladder at the university because they're at the laboratory, which is, uh, helps a lot. In terms of some of these programs like childcare, so uh, as I mentioned, there are, we have 250 childcare slots, 80 are reserved for faculty, so there's 170 for postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduates. The caveat there is the postdocs could not possibly afford it because it's not subsidized for postdocs. So for graduate students and for undergraduates, that's very heavily subsidized, uh, partly with state funding, although that's under threat in Governor Brown's budget right now. Uh, and so through a combination of, uh, of graduate students all qualify as impoverished people. So. <laughs> So, so they sort of automatically are eligible for these state programs. So we're able to make it affordable for graduate students and, and undergraduates. Our postdocs uh, at Berkeley now are unionized. Uh, and we have not, uh, and I anticipate as they get better organized that we're going to start seeing demands for childcare from the postdoc union. And that will be very inter interesting to see how that evolves. I have a question for both Bob and a little bit for Heidi, which is more about graduate students. I'm a science dropout after I got my, went through my postdoc. Um, when I was in a biology graduate program at Tufts, in my lab, well, in the other, in a different lab, the um, tenured woman professor dealt with the childcare problem by nursing her baby at school. And she would interview prospective graduate students nursing her baby. Um, that's one approach. Um, there, another issue I'd like to just bring up is um, other family emergencies. When, for uh, some odd reason, most of us in one lab, the, our fathers died. And one woman, her 
was from Korea. And she came to me and said, when her father was dying, should I go home? Or should I interrupt my research and go home? And I told her she had to. Um, her husband asked his advisor at Brandeis the same question, and that was only his father-in-law, and that advisor said, of course you have to go home. So I'm just saying that there are a few other areas there that could be thought about. Uh, uh, I can answer. Yeah, we'll both answer, but I'll, I'll just say, speaking from the, well, first of all, as a uh, senior administrator, but also as someone who has a daughter who's in exactly Heidi's situation, almost word for word, except she's a faculty member at BC, so, uh, or Boston University Medical School, uh, and was an MIT undergraduate, and served very well by MIT as an undergraduate, by the way. Uh, 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 so, so one of the two, I mean, two changes we've made relatively recently at Berkeley is that we extended the child care down to three months of age to infant care to address exactly this issue, uh, and that's rel relatively recent. Uh, now, that is extraordinarily expensive uh, because of federal laws connected with care of infants, and so it has to be heavily subsidized. Uh, and, and then the second thing is uh, we generalized our emergency care to take care of essentially every situation, and we encourage people to go home and uh, address issues of crises, uh, crises in, in, in their home. You know, whether or not, you know, in any individual department, there's a, uh, a, a uh, you know, a department chair who's a throwback, you know, that's all, that's very diff difficult to control, but we that do. That doesn't happen at MIT. No, it doesn't happen at MIT, <laughs> only at Berkeley, right? Uh, but we do, we, do, we do our best anyway. But I think Heidi can probably discuss this better than I can. So with my three children, all of them, I nursed for over a year. And I was fortunate in that for the first year while I was still at MIT, I had an office that had a door. And um, the Medela breast pump is your friend. <laughs> I traveled extensively um, for my job. I had to travel. And so take that breast pump along and you keep the milk coming. Um, I think what universities can do along these lines in situations where you may not have an office with a closed door, in addition to the daycare facilities, they should set up lactation rooms so women can have a, a safe, clean place to pump so they don't have to sit in the bathroom or some other horrible situation which I've had to do. In and fact, they have to. A so. uh, little known provision under the health care, the health care reform law that passed uh, late last year and now there's been uh, regulations issued is that any organization, it's very much like the FMLA, family medical leave in terms of who's affected. If you're an organization, over 50 employees, you must have a private room made available for women uh, to pump as needed. It cannot be the bathroom um, and it is now required. So that that's actually gives women another leg to stand on in terms of asking for that kind of, uh, that kind of space. So, so there, let me so just, now you need Let me just comment that the School of Science has already done this at MIT. There's a lactation room within a five minute walk of every uh, lab or office in the School of Science. It's so wonderful that all these things have happened since I left <laughs> MIT. <laughs> Let me address the other question you asked, though, and that's about personal family emergencies. Um, any time there's a personal family emergency of any level, you should be able to go to your boss, your, your advisor, and say, I've got a personal family crisis. And if they don't say, go deal with your family crisis, then you need to talk to your HR people because your family has to always come first. Um, my name's Catherine Wyman, and I brought eight students from um, Xavier College Prep High School in Phoenix with me to this symposium, and we are very excited to be here. And I really, <laughs> I, I really enjoyed your, your panel. Lisa, we've relied heavily on the um, Why So Few and other research documents from the AAW, and, and it has helped inform a lot of what we do. And, when I started at Xavier two and a half years ago, um, one of my colleagues, who's the, we have an art gallery on campus, and she's an MFA and curator of the gallery, and she came to me after I'd been there about a week and said, have you seen this data? We've got a problem with women studying science, technology, engineering, and math. And we started an, ev an event you know, founded by the artist. The artist and I got together. She says a right brain and a left brain got together and had Girls Have It Day, which is an event to encourage middle school girls in, in STEM fields. We had 400 girls on campus on Friday. And I think that a lot of that is due to 
400 girls, excuse me, and their parents. Um, a lot of that is due to, to um, your efforts, and I appreciate that. And, and Heidi, I, I could relate very, very well to everything you had to say, and, and um, I, I just want to throw a shout out to American Airlines for helping me when I had my Medela breast pump and had a flight delay in Chicago. Um, <laughs> but Bob, I had a question for you about your statistics and um, the increase. Um, I enjoyed seeing that increase um, in women professorships at, at UC Berkeley, and I wondered, um, it didn't split out by field, and I wondered, how was that across the board, or, or what were the numbers in the STEM field? Yes, so that's across the board. Uh, in STEM fields, our numbers are not very different from MIT's. 20% of our uh, faculty in STEM fields are, are, are women. It's been going up gradually, uh, uh, but uh, not as rapidly as we would like. And I, I do have to say, because I don't, I don't want to be Pollyannish here, uh, we have continuing challenges in two departments, one of which I happen to belong to, which is physics. Uh, and, and, and the second is electrical engineering and computer science in terms of women graduate students. And so we've made tremendous progress in most departments, but frankly not in either physics or, or EECS. In spite of the fact in the physics department, the last current and previous department heads are, are women. Uh, department heads are outstanding, uh, outstanding scientists. And so it's... If, if I could just jump in there. One of the things that I noticed about the MIT report that I think is we found on other campuses as well is that very interestingly, pro that progress has a double-edged sword, right? I mean, you look at the numbers, and you're, you're so glad to see more women faculty in various positions, more women in senior leadership team positions. And then, though, you have those faculty reporting that some people are starting to think that, well, are, are the credential, you know, is the, is the bars high for women because they've been working so hard to get women and kind of uh, questioning whether they actually, you know, would have gotten in under a regular, regular kind of process. And... Uh, that, you know, I find unfortunate, but I do think it's part of the process moving forward um, and just diversity as it goes. It's never going to be, it's always going to be a bumpy ride. So uh, the fact that the progress is being made is good, but it's, we also have to deal with, the, in some respects, the consequences of our progress in order to then make the next step forward. I have a technical <clears throat> question about Title IX. My understanding is that one of the reasons we know so much about Title IX in sports is because the Title IX sports implementation was delayed because it was perceived as being especially difficult to implement, and there was a there was a, uh, there were a series of um, pieces of legislation that were passed for the implementation of Title IX in sports. Um, what I'm not so clear on is uh, what Title IX compliance in STEM looks like. And uh, I don't know that there's been any specific legislation that lays out what Title IX compliance in, in, in STEM looks like, or anywhere in higher education for that matter, in, in the educational programs of higher education. I know that a number of programs uh, that have benefited women's graduate education, for example, have grown out of Title IX, but I'm unclear on what um, academic s Title IX compliance in STEM looks like. Right. Well, you're right about athletics in the sense that actually all of Title IX was not actually implemented for more than three years. Uh, and a, or coala coalition that I chair called the National Coalition for Women and Girls in, in Education was actually founded because the government was dragging its feet in terms of implementing Title IX, period. So the Title IX regs finally started to come out in 1975, and there was a big battle about how sports would be handled. Um, and you'll be interested to know that uh, one of the biggest uh, players in that fight were football coaches. Um, and one of the things that they were concerned about was how the numbers would play and so forth. And they, they were actually the ones who, who advocated for proportionality, never thinking that women might actually um, start surpassing men on college campuses. Um, in terms of STEM, there's a couple of things that go on. Number one, obviously there's, there, there are the regulations for Title IX itself in terms of what the law states. Uh, you can always contact the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education to ask for more, but interestingly enough, this particular issue is one that we've been able to convince the Obama administration to take up. And so um, while there are good examples of Title IX STEM compliance reviews out there, and I mentioned NASA to, uh, as a specific great example, and you can go to NASA's website and find it. You can go to OCR's website and find it as well. What's actually also going to be happening later this year is that OCR is going to be uh, putting out uh, specific guidance on Title IX and STEM. 
and we've not had that before. So while there have been kind of, uh, it's been mandated through legislation, Rod Wyden was the one who, a uh, senator from Oregon, who was the one who started making the, uh, NASA do their stuff through their appropriations, right? I mean, if you tie it to money, you can get folks to do just about anything. Uh, and at that point, um, that's when we started having some good working models. Uh, but there are compliance reviews going on right now. Uh, Ten different schools getting compliance reviews in terms of Title IX and STEM this year, and the guidance should be out probably, I would guess, September for back to school. Sarah? I'm switching topics again, and this is, this is uh, when the women scientists, when we were asked to give the talks, we were not asked to talk about our personal life. So I have a couple of comments for work-life balance which are in direct contrast to Heidi's, so you're welcome to argue with me offline or online or whatever is appropriate. But I will say a couple things. One is I also, unfortunately, have to operate like a single mother, so I do no breakfast, lunch, dinner, shopping, et cetera, et cetera. And in my family, some of the things you described, they're actually not acceptable. So if the child forgets something or something goes wrong on the order of I have to do something, it doesn't happen, and then the next time, hopefully, it doesn't happen again. Those things like lice, I mean, I I'm really, really hoping that what you said isn't like an everyday thing and that you just chose examples I'd like to know, actually, just to sort of show the worst case scenario. And you know, I have, what happened to me actually was quite different. I never thought this was possible because when I was younger, probably right up until I had kids, I was probably the most unorganized person alive. And one of my female professor friends at another university who does not have children and will never have them, calls it the motherhood gene. I don't know if this is true or not, but it forced me to go to an unprecedented level of, of organization, which I actually thought was not possible at all. I wish someone had took me aside and said, you know what, this is something I only learned two weeks ago. You only have to do grocery shopping once a week. I honestly didn't know that. I used to go like every two days. I actually figured out how to do it, and just as a technical, I'm sure everybody already knew this, but why didn't they tell me? Like the fruit that you want to give your kids for lunch, the things that will go bad that are really yummy, you know, they can get that like Monday and Tuesday, and sort of by Friday they get the apples. You guys knew that? <laughs> you should have told me. It took me a long time. I learned all this stuff from scratch. And I used to think that cooking would take forever. I learned, um, how to, I just, uh, this has just been unfolding, but I learned how to cook steak very quickly. So I can actually, I'm not happy about doing this, but I do this stuff, okay? So I've managed to come to this. And then the other thing was about work. So we have the work-life balance. The other thing was about work, that I now choose my, how I spend my time at work exceptionally carefully. I always thought I did this, but now it's even at a higher level. And when I do that, I don't waste time, you know? But I do still have enough time to sort of hang around with my students or do stuff. And so for me, the work-life balance was, I wouldn't call it like a tragic level of organization, because who wants to run their life in a way that is like, you know, run my personal life like a business. It's ridiculous. But on the other hand, I did, and I found I benefited, and I'm still sort of striving to come to some equilibrium. Um, but that stuff that you mentioned, I just wanted the audience to know, I wish we could have, we didn't want the conference to be dominated by everybody complaining about their personal life. Um, but I wanted you to get like another perspective. And I'm sure this will change, and there's some months or, you, you know, windows that will be horrible. But on the whole, you know, it's streamlined, and it's not a pleasant thing to have to do everything. But at the same time, there's a great way to do it, and I love my, my kids, and my job works out well. And I'll leave you just with one piece of advice of how, how to make it all work, at least what I think. First of all, if you have extended family, try to live near them or have them live near you. I have no family, unfortunately. Other than that, try to negotiate to get paid well enough so you can pay for things like having other people help you with the chores to make life a little bit easier. Okay, and you're welcome to respond if you want. Yeah, Sarah no, and I often question. disagree about things in public. It's become a habit of ours. Um, <laughs> yeah. Keep it brief. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, no, I, I, in fact, I agree with, with nearly everything you said. Um, a lot of what I talk about I use for dramatic effect. Um, they are all true stories, but they don't happen on a daily basis, um, especially head lice, thank God. Uh, I do agree with you. Um, I have a housekeeper that comes. She is worth her weight in gold, you know, and, I'll, I'm, and what I pay her is, is worth every penny. Um, I don't have family nearby. Uh, my mother's only two and a half hours. She's two and a half hours away, so she can help out when I'm on trips like this. Um, but I, I'm a single mother. You know, I'm divorced, so there is no other person. It's only me. It makes for um, very different things. I don't. Uh, one thing I don't agree with you is 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 that you can be uh, you can be balanced. I think over you can integrate over a week and be balanced. You can maybe even, if you're you know, very well organized, and I agree with Sarah that you, you go to new levels of organization when you're a working mom. Uh, and that's why people ask you to do more stuff, because you seem to get stuff done, because you have to, to move on. Then they ask you to do more things, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, but I think at any given moment, things happen and the balance swings. 
And if you think that at every moment of every day, now Sarah is like, she's, she's in a different class than me, I guess, but for me, any given moment, I'm swinging back and forth, and if I can get five hours in the work zone, I think that's a really good day. And then there's the other times. I, I don't think there is a balance. I think it balances over the long term. Okay, I, I want to not draw this out. I just want to say thank you. I just wanted to hear whether or not that all happened in one day. So thanks a lot. <laughs> I actually have a question for both of you. And, the, and, and an empirical observation, I mentioned that uh, I had a daughter who was an undergraduate uh, here at Berkeley during the 90s when all this was happening, actually. So it was fun to hear a woman student's perspective. Uh, and, and, but now that she's a faculty member, she's super organized, single mother of three, just like, the, yeah. just like you are. And the consequence of that is, is that uh, she's by far the best organized a young faculty member in her department over in the medical school at, at, at BU. So every single time there's a committee to be chaired or a task to be done, the department head asks her because she's clearly the most confident young faculty member in the department. Uh, and then my, she always calls me and my phone rings. She says, Dad, the department chair just asked me to, uh, to, to chair X committee. What do you think, et cetera, right? And it's very complex. And so I'm interested for both of you. Uh, or maybe anyone else uh, in the in the audience, uh, just well, in trying to give mm -hmm. her advice. Actually, it's yeah. a very the hard. The first rule is to say no as often as possible, but don't tell Mark or, or Ed I said that. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is I, I have benefited tremendously from this level of organization with my Exoplanet Sat project, where I showed you the demo model. So it's completely true that it carries over into other aspects. That's what I'll say. One of the things that we've seen from uh, the Center for Work-Life Balance in academia, when they talk to, to women faculty and male faculty about, about this particular issue, is that um, academia isn't that much different uh, from the rest of the workplace, in that there's kind of this uh, maternal wall, so to speak. Uh, they used to call it the glass ceiling, but it isn't, it, it isn't so much necessarily women as it is women with children. Um, and we see that in the pay gap and how that manifests itself. AEW has done a lot of study on wage discrimination, and one of the things that we've seen is that even when you compare apples to apples, so in other words, one year out of college, uh, have the same major and go into the same field, there's already a 5% gap. Ten years down the road, even though women are more likely to get a master's degree, uh, again, same major, same field, severe regression analysis to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, there's a 12% gap. So the farther up the food chain you go, the bigger the gap is, which is a, a huge issue. Um, but the other piece there is that there kind of is this assumption that women's lives revolve around their biology. And women who um, control their biology get rewarded and paid more. Now what's interesting though is that when you look at wages for men, men who have children actually make more than men who don't. Whereas women who have children actually make less than women who don't. So, you know, while I can under appreciate not necessarily wanting to get hung up on this, at the same time, women and men are both still very much constrained by cultural expectations about what they're going to do and what they're going to focus on. The Family Medical Leave Act, when it was passed back in 1993, one of its actual stated intentions was to help to dispel stereotypes about what was appropriate work for men and women and to, to try and encourage men and women to equally share childcare. Um, there's lots of debate about whether that's been useful or not, but I do think that these are things that we can't ignore because the reality is uh, there are assumptions being made on our behalf, and so we do have to address them. Well, let me answer his question, too, because he asked me. Um, tell her to say no. That's what Sarah said. <laughs> and also evaluate things very strategically. Um, when I get, I get asked to give talks all the time, but now I only give them if they're like local, not even it, the lo not even that anymore. But um, you, you, you have to evaluate these, all these requests very strategically and make sure that you're getting the best value for your time. Yeah. Glad you agreed to come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two remarks and a question. First on work-life balance. I don't want the dads or the, the men in the audience to think that they should be let off the hook. Uh, it is very important for both parents to uh, support and work with their children. And this is really becoming an issue for young uh, male graduate students, postdocs, research staff, and, and faculty. Uh, I think that there are advantages to parenthood in terms of organization and leadership 
maybe one of the reasons why the fathers rise up is because, in fact, they can develop some empathy and some ability to work with people. I can speak there from personal experience. Uh, being a parent really helps. A second observation is that my department, actually, when Mark Kastner was the head, uh, had a NASA Office of Civil Rights Title IX Compliance Review. It actually was spread across our, our two uh, terms, the end of his and then the beginning of mine. Uh, we were uh, thoroughly uh, assayed and reported favorably. Uh, the department was fine. There were some issues about uh, having information posted on compliance officers, university regulations, and so on. But anyone who wants to know what it was like to experience a Title IX review in academia can read a little piece that I wrote for the MIT uh, Tech uh, student newspaper, which you can find by just Googling MIT Title IX. And then the third, the, the question, which is really devoted to, uh, directed to you, Lisa, follows up from something that Abby Stewart said this morning, which is that one of the ways that we can improve university climates is to have uh, climate assessments. Uh, some professional societies do this, the American Physical Society, their Committee on the Status of Women in Physics, and the Committee on Minorities have climate site visits. I know that AAUW, I believe, does as well. Could you say something about that, please? Yeah, AUW's research on this issue goes way back. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, AUW first kind of got lots of press when we started, uh, we came out with a groundbreaking report back in the 90s called How Schools Shortchange Girls. Um, and since then have done a variety of different studies. And the, the one specific to college campuses, uh, we did one in, uh, just recently in the last couple of years called Drawing the Line, which is about sexual harassment on campus. Um, that's another thing that I should, should, should certainly make you aware of, is that if, if there were two issues that I were to pick that this reinvigorated Office of Civil Rights is focusing on, it's STEM and it's sexual assault. Uh, there's going to be new guidance coming out on sexual assault issues as well. Uh, and I think that part of the reason for that is that there were just too many stories of uh, people who were harassed, uh, both men and women, by the way, because Title IX is gen gender neutral, and the harassment, anti-harassment provisions are the ones that men most likely use, um, but too many people who've been harassed and literally harassed out of their majors, uh, harassed out of a certain class. All of us know that there's situations where if you mistake in the class in this you know, winter semester, you're not going to get a chance till next time and how all that works. Um, so there are ways to do assessments uh, in drawing the line. We have a sample survey that uh, colleges and universities can use uh, in order to uh, address that. Uh, we are going to have new research coming out, uh, on, but it's going to be basically middle school and high school on harassment, but also including the whole cyber harassment issue and climate issues. But I do still think that will be instructive for college campuses, because these are your incoming freshmen. Uh, and so what they learn uh, that's appropriate, what they see that's challenged or not challenged uh, in high school is certainly going to um, help inform their behavior in college. Uh, so one of the things that we found with the whole climate assessments is that, and I hope you found this the case with the Title IX compliance review, is that people are really hesitant at first. They, they want nothing to do with it. But then when they actually find out what it is and see that it's not uh, intended to be a pejorative thing, it's literally to kind of show you how healthy your campus is and ways for you to become more healthy and more proactive, um, that it actually can be an affirming thing to see the good things that you're doing, but then also to get good ideas for things that you can do perhaps even better or uh, you know, new things that you can institute. So. Again, thank you for coming and thank you for tracking the data on women in faculty. But I too um, am a, like you look at staff. And I spent 10 years on the staff at Stanford and MIT, about five years at each university, as an engineer, not as a research scientist in facilities. And I never worked with a female plumber, a female electrician, or any female tradesman ever. And they do exist. I was just at a job the other day at Genentech, not far from here, and they had two female electricians on their staff. So when you look at communities, we really need to look at gender and ethnicity and race across the entire community. And, and likewise, administrative assistants. I don't remember ever running into an administrative assistant that was a male at MIT. I did at Stanford. I know quite a few at Stanford. Um, but certainly in the trades, and I can tell you as an engineer, I really want to know how to use tools, 
and I would have probably had more comfort level working with women electricians on some issues so I could be a better engineer. So thank you. The career and technical uh, education issues are huge. You know, I think a lot of times when we think of non-traditional jobs, uh, for people, for academics, we think of STEM, but there's always these non-traditional jobs uh, in the skilled trades where people can make a good wage, get benefits, um, much less likely to be outsourced uh, to another country. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work, particularly through welfare programs, uh, but also just through retraining programs from the manufacturing sector, both men and women, to get more women into the skilled trades. Um, it's been tough, because I would say, actually, if you, if you sat a women plumber down with a, a, a woman engineer and they talked about um, climate issues, pay and promotion issues, they would have a lot of things in common to talk about. So it's interesting, and perhaps even a place where we can look to for additional best practices that they may seem like disparate fields, but they're facing a lot of the same issues. And this comes back, this comes back to climate, always comes back to the climate of the institution. And so I, I hope that the people here who are in charge of these academic facilities are hearing that message, that it is not just academia, it's the broader climate issue. Last question. Hazel. Thank you. I'd like to thank the three of you for really interesting presentations. And I have two questions which are related. One is for Bob and one is for Lisa and maybe for Bob as well, and perhaps for Heidi as well. The, the question for you, Bob, is, um, in this interesting diversity center that you've put together, where there's going to be interesting research coming out, do you have a mission of some kind of actionable items that are part of the whole process of the center, in that it's not just research, it's going to be research that will change climate because part of the job of the faculty is to suggest ways to actually take the research and move it into actionable change. And then if I, sh I should just say the second question because they're kind of embedded, which is the role, the question of the role of universities in addressing um, elementary school education and the climate that children are exposed to from actually before elementary school, preschool education, which I think plays a huge role in helping kids figure out whether they're gonna to go to the Lego side and become engineers or go to, you know, the baby carriage side and go on a different track. And so that's also an actionable question and I'm kind of mixing them up so I don't take too many question times, but, but you see there's the, the question of action items and then the role of the universities in getting involved in very junior education levels that I think could have a huge impact on the pipeline. So uh, on, on the Haas Diversity Research Center, uh, you know, Berkeley with its activist traditions, there's not difficulty, any difficulty in encouraging people to be active. Uh, and so there will be an activism component of it. But frankly, our goal here really was to make equity and inclusion a serious academic subject with serious research involving economics and public health, et cetera, and uh, to create a whole set of, of undergraduate and graduate courses in the area. So it's really more the intent of this center more is to flesh out the purely academic part uh, of, 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 of these issues, which then ultimately will translate into action. In terms of K through 12, the, the, our educational disparities uh, program is entirely focused on, on K through 12. And in parallel to that, we actually, it's part of one of the things I've done at Berkeley, uh, is we established our own charter school. So we have our own K through 12 school, uh, which is basically, I don't want to call it a laboratory because, especially with African Americans, <laughs> that's the worst thing you can do, uh, right, is to, you know, tell kids that they're, you know, subject of academic study, right? I mean, we're trying to provide a really high quality education, but in, in the school, it is a living laboratory where we're trying to figure out uh, you know, how, how do you do K through 12 education uh, properly and in a way that's scalable, particularly oriented towards kids from Oakland and Richmond and right, who come from uh, often challenging inner, inner city environments? Um, I just wanted to address the academic piece real quickly. Um, AUW, one of the things we really strive to do is to translate 
research into action. Uh, it's part of where we give our grants and, and look at the work that our fellows do. And so I'm, I'm really glad to know about this center because I would be willing to bet there are some great, uh, re there's some re good research out there that I could turn into some pretty cool bills uh, in terms of things to do. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, so, uh, but in terms of the, the K through 12 stuff, this is really important because um, this is where it all starts. One of the things that uh, our report, Why So Few, this is what it looks like, uh, talks about is something called stereotype threat uh, and how much it affects uh, girls' and boys' performance. It's essentially the notion that uh, the teacher's biases are a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if, 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 if a teacher says, um, uh, you know, that the boys tend to do better on this test, boys are going to do better on that test than girls. Um, and they're going to rate themselves better than girls. Um, but if you say everybody does the same, in other words, if you say this is just a test and it doesn't matter to, based on gender, if you kind of act, it's not going to be a difference, then there literally isn't a difference, right? Although boys still rate themselves higher. Boys always rate themselves higher on everything, which I find fascinating because girls rate themselves lower. So there's this kind of very interesting dichotomy in terms of self-perceptions between girls and boys. Um, but I do want to caution because one of the things that has kind of been sweeping the nation is the whole notion of single-sex education. Um, and AUW isn't against single-sex education per se. We are against the, the current federal regulations that allow single-sex education without any uh, notice of civil rights laws or uh, pre pre preserving civil rights of the kids. Because what's happening, unfortunately, in some of these schools is you'll have a science class that they decided to split by gender. Um, and on any, you know, a particular day, the boys are going outside and digging in the dirt for worms, and the girls are staying inside and analyzing the composition of their makeup. Now, I got to tell you, on any given day, the, probably half the girls would rather go dig worms, and the boys would rather play with the makeup. So the reality is, you know, when we can create these stereotypes and not even intend it. I guarantee you the teachers who came up with those lesson plans thought they would be interesting, thought they would learn something, and had no clue about kind of the, the misconceptions and stereotypes that they were perpetuating. So we do have to be careful. Um, there's absolutely room for single-sex uh, kinds of programs, particularly after-school programs, where uh, girls can really experiment and, and, and feel free to kind of take their time to figure out a problem. Um, but we do need to, to really think about the K-12 through environment and make sure that we aren't making assumptions about who's going to be good at what. Heidi's like going to get the you. last statement because we have to wind up. I just want to very briefly address your second question. Um, I believe the universities have a very strong role to, p to play in, in the, uh, the pre-K through 12 um, educational role for two reasons. One is you look at all these young ladies here in the front row here, and I can tell you that my daughter, middle schooler, would much rather talk to them about science. And if they're interested in science, she'll be interested in science. She won't listen to me because I'm her mother. So uh, young people can connect to the younger people in much more effective ways than a gray-haired professor can do it. But at the same time, the science that gets done at the universities can have broad public appeal if it's done correctly, and it can bring in the young people and bring in the, the, these young people with the excitement of the science that gets done, particularly at places like MIT. So I believe there is a strong role to play there. Well, uh, let me, uh, th let's thank all the speakers again, and I'm drawing the session to a close.